Welcome to day four of our Pollinator Week virtual presentation series, sponsored by NIPSCO and the Night Source Charitable Foundation. Thank you for joining us. I cannot wait to showcase what we have in store tonight. Each of the days of this week, we have tried to offer enriching content that brings our new Pollinator Garden Landscaping Guide to life. Um, we've done that by bringing you the experts that are behind the scenes making that guide possible. So on day one, we released the guide. On day two, we offered you some incredible options for developing pollinator habitat in your home garden. Last night, we welcomed experts that talked about the majesty of the bees and the lepidoptera, the moths and the butterflies. And so through the week, we've tried to really hook you on the concept of pollinators, their biodiversity, the importance in our landscape, but tonight is something truly special, truly magical. Tonight, we are helping to showcase the love that you might have for pollinators by witnessing a picture, a photograph, maybe an illustration, some artwork, maybe through your own cultural connections to these pollinators. Before I go too much further, I'm so excited for what we have in store. I'm just gonna provide a brief recap of the week's programs. Now, these are um, available on our Facebook events page. Um, also, you can visit www.savedunes.org, click on our news tab and find our Pollinator Week virtual presentation series schedule. Um, so you can sign up here to receive a digital copy of our guide as soon as it's released. Um, it also charts the, you know, the path that we've taken throughout the week to get to where we are tonight for pollinator art, photography, and culture. I can't wait to get started on this, but I also want to, you know, keep you tuned in for tomorrow night when we bring it all together and highlight how conservation efforts across the region by some of the, the most significant conservation partners that we have um, are working together to restore pollinator habitat in such a way that these irreplaceable creatures can not only survive but thrive across the region and how you play a really important role in your home garden, in your home landscape. Um, so please do tune in tomorrow at 6 p.m. Please sign up to receive a copy of the guide and um, you know, sign up for our newsletter. Um, stay connected with Save the Dunes because we'll be doing programming on our um, pollinator uh, efforts um, for a good, good deal of time to come. But tonight, wow, we have a full docket in store for you. Um, we're gonna start off with uh, a video of Susan Kurt taking images of pollinators that you may not even know are there. How are these images even possible? So I'm thrilled to introduce and honored really, to introduce Susan Kurt. She is a photographer and instructor of biology at Chicago State University. She resides in Northwest Indiana, where she is often found exploring and photographing the wild places around us. She's capturing insects, wildlife, native plants, and our ecosystems. And don't be surprised if you see her name on a photograph featured by one of your favorite conservation organizations. She's celebrated across the region. And so what I'm going to do now is transition into a video that I had the privilege of taking of Susan um, very recently. But what I'm going to do now is um, go ahead and play that video. We're out here today with Susan Kurt at Crestmore Prairie, a state dedicated nature preserve. And we're hoping to capture some pollinators at work pollinating. And Susan is going to help us to figure out what we need to do to take incredible pictures just like her. So Susan, we're looking forward to this today. I'm looking forward to it also. So I wanted to show you a few of the items that I use to often take macro photography images. 
And first off, my favorite is always in my back pocket. It's my cell phone. There's definitely photos that I take and videos that I take with my cell phone all the time. And it's always on hand. But when I'm looking to do a little bit more in-depth photography, I usually have two different camera setups that I'll use. I'm gonna show you the first one, which I've disassembled. So I have a camera body. I shoot Canon. Don't worry, other companies are just as good. And I will have a 100 to 400 millimeter lens. So you can get fairly close to an object without actually being close to it. However, you probably noticed that bugs and other insects can be quite small. So I do have a converter on here that extends the range. So I can actually get closer to the object using this. This is from Canon. Other companies do make um, these teleconverters also though. This just clicks right on in, assuming I can match up all the little red dots. And it does make the lens quite heavy. So you get quite a bit of a workout when you are using a lens like this. <laughs> I also have a sun shield. If you buy lenses, they'll sometimes come with these. It does help reduce glare on the lens. Before I put that on, I do like to wipe it down with either a microfiber like cloth that won't scratch the lens, or you can also get the cloth ones. So once this is all put together, it looks pretty impressive. But this is just a hood or, you know, to cut out the light. The other one that I will often use is this macro lens. The lens on here um, will, starts off at a macro. It goes one to one, which means that the object is as big as it appears. And then it goes out to five times magnification. But this is how I get a lot of the really close up macro photography shots. And the lens itself is very, very tiny. Again, not a lot of light, so you have to use a different, you have to use a flash with this. And that's this funky thing you see here on my camera. What I have on the front is basically a diffuser. And by using this, I don't get a lot of that glare and white, whited out spots on the flower or the insect I'm taking a picture of. And there's a bunch of different ways you can do one of these. Some wow. other things I always recommend, extra camera cards. Yeah. <laughs> extra camera batteries <laughs> and since I have a flash that requires double-a batteries I try to keep those also and I like these little fun um, battery holders oh, wow. <laughs> thank you so much Susan are we yes. gonna go out and take some pictures today that is the hope that's the hope so we just gotta go chase some some insects around all right let's do it all right we're here today at a black soil prairie called Crestmore Prairie this is a state dedicated nature preserve owned and managed by Shirley Hines Land Trust. We're going to head out on the Keith Ford Nature Trail to try to take some incredible pictures of pollinators in action. So a lot of times, especially before I start targeting an insect, I like to go through and I say, hey, I think I'm going to look at these plants over here. So I'll take a quick picture. Okay. And I'll look at my screen. Mm -hmm. If you forget to do that, all of a sudden you realize you've messed up with some dials or done something else and it's either completely dark or completely, completely whited out. And so I just like take that initial test shot. And then I can start looking for insects and other organisms that I like to see. I do occasionally forget to do this and I'm usually unhappy when that happens because that's when the fun stuff comes flying around. I can see one that's in a flower and now I'm just trying to keep focus on that flower and wait for it to emerge, which is just it. Got our little metallic bees on them. So these are uh, fairly small bees and you can see each flower has at least one. And this is one I would normally use the more close-up lens, but I also like taking video to see the um, action that's happening. A lot of times you want to get more eye level with it, and mm -hmm. so I took some pictures standing up mm -hmm. of this butterfly, 
and then I crouch down to try to get a look at it head on. Mm -hmm. And that brings a lot more personality to the insect, the butterfly, the beetle, the bee. When it's really windy, that's sometimes when I just break out the old cell phone and see if I can get some video. And if I'm hand holding my phone, I often like to do it in slow motion because you can have a little bit more camera shake. But it doesn't always have to be that way. A lot of times what I would do is take pictures with my cell phone first if I don't have my camera out. But we're going to try to get a picture of this with the camera and this contraption setup that I have going on right here. Okay, but there is a little bee on here. And I can go in, take a couple pictures, watch it fly away, and then hope I had everything, look at my screen and hope everything was good. Good news is he went to the next plant. So I'll zoom in a little bit, and I've decided I need a little bit more light, so I change my flash system here, and I go in again. And because I usually take pictures without a tripod, I do like to brace myself as much as possible. So like even here you can see I'm bracing my lens against my leg mm -hmm. a little bit. We're still watching the bee flying around though. And he has decided to abandon us. He or she. <laughs> so yeah, so we have a little metallic sweat bee that I was taking pictures of. Um, it has now flown away. But it's really fun to watch insects through these close-up cameras or through, through a lens. Because you can actually see what they do, how they gather the pollen, how they interact with one another. I do a scattershot approach on a lot of the insects. And then when I get home and can look at them on my computer screen or even on the screen on the camera, I can then go and try to identify and see what I have looked at. Right. And my biggest tip, no matter what direction you take the insect's photo with, get the eyes in focus. If the eyes are in focus, we'll be drawn in. As, as human beings, we are attracted to eyes. And so get them in focus, and it doesn't even matter if the rest is blurry. Wow. <laughs> I hope that you were blown away as much as I was. And I've seen that video several times now. But I just wanted to bring Susan into the conversation to talk a little bit more about, um, you know, the patience and endurance that it takes to not only master your craft, but to, you know, still stick with the pollinators, still stick with the insects. What is it that motivates you? What, what keeps you coming back for more? Well, I definitely have to say that there's such a wide variety of insects out there. And when you get up close to them, even if they're just a few millimeters big, they're actually quite pretty, usually. Usually. <laughs> um, but then they have like those metallic colors. They have little scales or feather-like looking structures on them. I really like close-up of faces. Um, and they're just fascinating and stuff that you can see once you get back to the computer screen and blow these organisms up. Mm -hmm. um, it's just amazing um, the complexity that they have. And I did want to point out that even though we were at a nature preserve, uh, for this video, my favorite place to take pictures of insects is just in my yard. I'll walk around, the dog's out running around, and I'll just go around and take a bunch of photos. Well, um, and I've had the privilege of picking you up at your house for this adventure, and so I know that you've got a lot of native plants around you. And so that's one of the joys of native gardening is when you start to incorporate those plants into your landscape, suddenly you have all of these tremendous, you know, visitors, these wonderful visitors. And so if you have an interest in photography, like you have your, um, your subject right at hand, right outside your doorstep. Oh yeah. And there are numerous pictures in this guide that came from my backyard. Oh my gosh. Um, I think we have a couple of minutes. Would you mind if I just pull up um, the guide and, you know, just kind of page through? I hope people realize how much work has gone into creating 
um, the spread that we have in our guide. Um, here you, um, I won't go through the whole presentation again, of course, um, but you know, our cover image is a uh, Susan Kurt original. Um, this, you know, comes directly from, you know, her ability to capture images, um, you know, using the techniques that she's, that she's learned. And, ho and hopefully, Susan, we can engage you in more programs in the future, um, you know, perhaps, you know, give people a one-on-one on how to take these pictures. But, you know, as you're looking through um, this spread on our native pollinators, you'll see a Susan Kurt a Susan Kurt and and that's throughout the guide it's throughout the guide and, and we have a couple of other photographers featured as well <laughs> yeah definitely. but I mean they're not they're not all yours but my goodness we can't all do it all um but the, Susan's work is featured throughout this guide and my goodness um what an honor it has been um this picture in particular Susan do you want to talk about um, bees that take naps and flowers. Okay, so one of my <laughs> favorite uh, bee subjects has to be the bee. Is is I mean, aside from being bees, um, are uh, the male bees. So male bees don't need to make a nest. Uh, they're there for one purpose only, and that's to uh, to mate. And so as they're just hanging around waiting for that female to come around, they have to eat, they have to sleep, they have to do everything, right? They're a living organism. And these will just hang out wherever they happen to be, um, in flowers or um, like clinging on to the ends of leaves with their mouth parts. So you'll see them oftentimes dangling on the ends of grass blades uh, or grass leaves. And I usually find them about mid-afternoon and this is a particular type of long, um, uh, long antenna beetle, long horn beetle. Um, they're the super fuzzy ones, so I love them. And they really like obedient plant. And so pretty much every place I go, um, I like to look at the obedient plant when it's in bloom. And in the afternoon, I'll usually find these bees inside of it. Um, and this one was actually at Crestmore Prairie. Right. So. Yeah, right. And so we actually do have a hairy flower beetle image that Susan captured um, this beetle on a, on a milkweed plant. Mm -hmm. And then we have this longhorn bee that's emerging from that obedient plant up here. So fabulous, absolutely fabulous, Susan. Thank you so much, uh, not only for contributing to our guide, but for sharing your talent. And we can't wait to see more of your images. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it, um, in, in time to come, and hopefully we can do more programming. Um, hopefully, um, I'm meeting up with a person tonight with the Doomland Photography Club and uh, to talk about photographing fireflies and how to do it. So uh, stay tuned, everyone. This so one fun. is on a trajectory for the stars. Thank you, Susan. Thanks. Well, we're at that time in our um, day four of our Pollinator uh, Week presentations to invite Joelle Perez to the stage. Joelle is an incredible colleague and supporter of conservation in our region, um, particularly in the dune and swale environments found in northwestern Lake County, Indiana. So Joelle Perez is the Southern Lake Michigan Rim Project Director for the Nature Conservancy. Joelle develops innovative urban conservation strategies that link benefits for people and nature in our region. He also oversees an experienced and dedicated team of land managers who steward a network of extremely high quality nature preserves in an incredibly complex landscape. He is a proud Latino and a dreamer who grew up in East Chicago. So we've got a local asset here that we definitely wanna celebrate. Any free time Joel gets, he likes to spend it out, outdoors exploring the marvels that our region has in store. So Joel, I will invite you to go ahead and share your screen and we can't, we can't wait to hear your presentation. Thanks for that introduction, Victoria. <laughs> All right, can you see that? Yes, we can, thank you. All right, perfect. Well, um, welcome everybody, good afternoon. Um, 
this is my presentation and it will be on monarchs and people. Um, like Victoria said, my name is Joel Perez, project director for the Nature Conservancy here in Northwest Indiana. Um, I'm also the lead organizer for the annual Festival de la Monarca. So if you've, have, if you've attended that, um, thank you for your support. Now, before I start, um, I wanted to acknowledge a few things. Um, first, that I do not represent the indigenous community. Um, and I do not do justice to all the knowledge that the indigenous people hold. Um, I also want to acknowledge that um, I am still in the learning process. And what I present to you today are just pieces of the truth, um, stories that, that I've um, come across and that I'm sharing. So I wanted to start off by um, showing you this image um, that was created. And let me find out how to click next. <laughs> All right, there it is. Okay. Um, so I wanted to show you this image that was created um, last year for the Wild Things presentation that I did earlier this year. Um, and it was created with some words. Uh, we, what we did was we showed an image of, of the monarch butterfly and people were able to input words that, um, you know, words that the first thing they thought of when they were looking at the monarchs. And so there is a huge number of list of words. Um, I, as you can see, the monarch butterfly is more than just a pollinator. Um, it represents so much the people and its environment and, and to the communities. Um, you might be able to relate to some, of, to some of these words. The truth is that some of the monarchs um, that are seen um, can, be, can be seen by different kinds of people with different backgrounds. Um, ranging all the way from Canada to, to south of the border in Mexico, where, where it, it, it overwinters, um, of course, touching our hearts along the way. Now, let's go back in time um, a little bit. Um, it's, um, well, before we go back in time, I just, I wanted to um, acknowledge that, you know, it's, it's important to work together. Um, it's important for, for people um, to work together just, just across the three countries. And you see efforts um, because we're all touched by the monarch butterflies. Um, so now we go back in time. Right before the, the, right before the even Spanish colonization, um, you can see images of butterflies through stone carvings and paintings of the indigenous groups that existed in Mexico before them. Um, so, so you can see how these pollinators, these butterflies, uh, were part of that culture um, for a really, really long time. Um, there is many different legends and myths about the monarch butterflies and other local butterflies, um, a lot of times tying them to the souls of their ancestors. Um, in some stories, they, they're, re they're returning souls of the loved ones. In others, they're the warriors that were killed in battle. Um, and there's many, many stories related to that. Um, the truth is that um, in a lot of indigenous groups, um, they believe um, that even after passing away, their souls lived on um, through, through nature and the environment. Um, and, and so it's, it, really, it really says a lot about you know, how, how much they really appreciated um, nature and its surrounding, how they really um, took care of it. Um, still today, uh, coincidence, coincidence or not, uh, the monarch arrival takes place during the celebrations of Day of the Dead in Mexico, uh, which happens to be early, early November, Day of the Dead celebrated November 2nd. Um, so there's still, there's, there is, you can see why, um, you know, and related to the monarch, why, you know, some groups may have believed that they were returning souls of their loved ones. Um, Day of the Dead um, is, you know, is, is a time where people celebrate and remember their loved ones. And it just so happens to be the time that the monarch flies right back to Mexico in the overwintering sites. For the people of Michoacan and um, other nearby areas, the monarch butterfly has always been part of their lives as far as they can remember. And if you ask anybody that's from Michoacan, um, they can tell you this. And it's, it has never, it has, it's not always obvious. And I could, I could say this being um, of Latino descent, um, growing up with monarchs literally all over my neighborhood and never really realized that it was a monarch butterfly until I started looking more into uh, the monarch butterfly that I realized it has been around me my whole entire life. 
And so for the longest time, um, I, I, I read something that for the longest time, it was unknown where the monarchs were going for the winter. Um, I think this highlights the importance of, of local knowledge and indigenous knowledge and something that we need to do a better job today. Um, uh, for, you know, it, it, if, if you follow that story, um, it, it took talking to the local community in Mexico to finally figure out where was the monarch going and where it was overwintering. Um, and it was information that the locals already knew. I mean, their whole, for generations, um, they, they knew that the monarch um, was coming, um, you know, to these overwintering sites. And, and you can see the, you know, really the importance of, of uh, communicating, you know, uh, just across borders and across different people. Um, all right, and in modern day today, um, you can still see in performances, um, you know, images of butterflies and it's still, the butterflies still play a big part of it. Um, here on the right, with Ballet Folklorico Yolotzin, you can see an image of the butterfly on, on the woman's dress. Um, also the dress is supposed to represent a butterfly um, with the black that you're seeing um, being the body of the butterfly. And in fact, some of the dances actually are supposed to mimic some of the bad butterfly patterns. In the center of the image, you see um, Aztec dancers and you also see the butterflies being displayed on some of their headgear. Um, and then although I am sharing part of the stories. Um, I, it, it is important to uplift, you know, those missing narratives. I, I have missing narratives here because sometimes there is missing narratives that we don't consider or um, we don't think about when we're having engagement on, on the monarch. And so I wanted to, to share here um, a presenter that we had at the last Monarch Festival last year, we had an opportunity because it was um, an online Monarch Festival to bring different people, different partners from um, farther areas of the region. And so here Maria de la Luz Marquez was able to share her story on, on last year's Monarch Festival. And you know, Maria de la Luz Marquez is from the Perepucha uh, indigenous people. And, 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 and really, um, a group that uh, a lot of people um, that didn't exist no longer, but clearly still exists today and, you know, uh, living among us. And so I've always, when one of my goals for creating um, events and engagements is, is always try to uplift those voices that uh, sometimes are not heard or are not part of, um, of, of events. Um, All right, next I will show you, today you can drive in East Chicago and find a lot of businesses still with that, with those images of, of the monarch butterfly. And this is what I was saying earlier when it's been around me this whole time and I never really noticed it. Um, even, even in East Chicago, you can find their sculptures of butterflies, um, monarch butterflies all throughout the cities. Here in East Chicago, here in my hometown that I grew up with. And so I'm eating this ice cream and I'm, I'm going to this taco shop where the mirror on your right is found. And never did I notice that, you know, monarchs are there. And so that just tells you um, how much monarchs really mean to people, um, especially those from the overwintering sites of, of Michoacan. And so it's, it's really one of the reasons um, why we decided to do the Monarch, the Festival de la Monarca um, in East Chicago is, is because, you know, all it took is was to honestly just pay attention um, to the community and realize that the love for the Monarch was already there. It was, it was nothing that we had to really push. Um, and so we decided to, to create this celebration with the East Chicago Festival de la Monarca, um, where we can uplift those voices, um, really put to the spotlight um, the love for the monarch that, that um, you know, the Latino community, especially the people of Michoacan um, had. And so a little more about this festival, not only did it in, does it include entertainment and pieces of cultural connection, but also provides learning opportunities for all ages. Not only 
on the monarchs, but also other pollinators. Um, because as you've probably heard before, um, if you put a garden for a monarch that includes milkweed, and of course you have to include nectar and sources for its migration, you're also creating a home and habitat for other pollinators. And so at the festival, we give away native plants um, of all sorts, including milkweeds to help support those, those struggling pollinators. And of course, this, this festival it cannot be possible without our partners. Um, it, as some of you may have already known her, Victoria is right there at the center of that picture, um, showing off beautiful native um, butterflies that exist in our region. And, and just, like, just like this festival, um, I'll, I'll say it again, I think, you know, in order to help the monarch butterfly, it, it really takes all of us and takes all people from all different backgrounds. Um, and later on in the slide, I will give you guys the link so you guys can find out more about our monarch festival and um, find out what, what this, this year's festival will look like. There will be a, an important announcement on that. Um, uh, coming soon. All right. Well, I know today was mostly on the monarchs, um, but I just wanted to share another pollinator that's connected to the indigenous groups in Mexico. And for those that may know, may not know, that is the hummingbird. Um, so here you see an image of Huitzilo Pochli. Um, he is the god of the sun and war. Um, and he is often represented by a hummingbird, sometimes also represented by an eagle. And you could, on his head, you could actually see those are supposed to be hummingbird um, feathers. And a lot of the sculptures, you'll see hummingbird feathers on, on its ear. Um, for those of you that are familiar, very familiar with the hummingbirds, you can probably guess why the hummingbird um, is a good representation of a warrior. Um, they aren't. They aren't the uh, easiest going creatures, uh, birds out there. Um, so one thing I wanted to share about Huitzilopochtli, um, which by the way has Huitzilin in its name, which means hummingbird, directly hummingbird. Um, it is said that this god um, appeared in a dream to, to, one, to a priest um, and it told him to find an, an eagle that was eating a snake while on top of a cactus. Um, if you didn't, you weren't familiar with the Mexican flag, well, that's exactly what's in the middle of the Mexican flag and exactly where um, Mexico City is located now. Um, it, was, it was a wetland and, you know, um, that was that was what the God said they were going to build the city, and that's where they built the city on top of a wetland um, that they that they filled in, in what is now present day Mexico City. Um, I, you know, as I said before, um, every time I look into cultural connections, I learn more about my culture, and it's just amazing how much you know appreciation for nature and um, I mean pollinators really the indigenous people really had. I mean, it's something that's super inspiring and that definitely pushes me to learn more about, um, you know, some, some of those missing narratives. And so I know for 10 minutes, that was very, very brief and, and very general, but I just wanted to share, uh, you know, some things and, and hopefully invite all of you um, to do your own research and, and look into, um, you know, your local indigenous groups and, 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 and really figure out you know, and, and learn about the way um, they viewed nature. And um, it, it, is, it is amazing. Um, another thing I'll mention, you might be wondering what the uh, left image there on your screen is of what it looks like an old man. In fact, it is an old man. Um, and so that is a costume uh, from, from a traditional dance called Danza de, de, de los Viejitos from the Michoacan region um, where the monarch overwinters. So a lot of times, um, at festivals and celebrations that um, you might attend in Mexico, um, where, where they'll, they'll have monarchs all over the place, dec decorating all kinds of things. Um, this might be one of those dances that you might um, be able to witness, the Danza Los Viejitos. And hopefully, we haven't had it yet, but hopefully we'll see it at a future uh, monarch festival so that you guys can all uh, enjoy. Um, again, 
here at the bottom of my screen, um, I have the Facebook page for our Festival de la Monarca that we have in East Chicago every year. Last year, it was um, all online. This year, we're going to have a hybrid approach. Um, follow the pay page so you can um, learn more about it and, and you can hear um, what we have in store for you guys for this year. Um, also is my email in case you have any questions or if you want to have a conversation on any of the topics that I talked about today, I would love to have that conversation with you or, or even learn more about uh, Monarch Festival or, or anything on Monarchs. Um, I, the Monarch is definitely one of those pollinators that I definitely never thought I would fall in love with, um, but I love doing engagement around. So that's it. So if, um, that's the end of my presentations. If anybody has any questions, um, I will be glad to answer them. Thank you, Joelle. What a gift it has been to have you present to everyone the transcendent nature of the cultural connections of the monarch and how that connects even more deeply to pollinators um, you know, in North America. You know, the monarch it travels over 3,000 miles across three countries. All of the people that it interacts with along the way are connected. And some of those connections have deep roots. Those overwintering sites, I know they're, they're in trouble right now, but so is the monarch habitat that it needs to arrive at those overwintering sites. And so it's, it's truly a joy and a celebration of life and those connections at your East Chicago Monarch Festival, where we're providing that content and the information that people need to put milkweed species in their gardens to support that migration, to support each generation of monarchs throughout butterfly season. But um, gosh, I could go on. So we're gonna have to have a conversation later on Joel, because I, I, I just love learning about, you know, the history, the deep history, the connections, um, and just the, you know, the inspiring and transcendent nature that the monarch holds that invites everybody in to celebrate all of our pollinators. Thank you. Um, my sincerest thanks for, for sharing your knowledge and wisdom and um, connecting all of us to those cultural roots. That was wonderful. Yeah, and I'll say, I'll say a final comment. Um, I think it's amazing when, you know, we're out there looking at pollinators and looking at all these critters around us. Um, it's really nice to, to something we never think about, you know, the different people interactions that bee or that hummingbird had. Um, throughout its journey or, or even within your neighborhood. I mean, how many of your neighbors saw it or, or had interaction with that same? It's, it's a way of connecting us all. And um, at the end of the day, I think, I think we all want to uh, protect Mother Earth. And um, yeah. And we it. can do that. We can do that in our gardens. Yep, exactly. So you guys that are hard at work restoring those natural areas have an easier job, no? <laughs> oh, maybe, maybe. Yeah. Um, thank you, Joel. I wanted to check in with Katie. Do we have any questions cropping up in our Facebook chat? We do have um, one question for Joel. Um, Jim is asking, um, he was interested in learning about the original idea for the EC Monarch Festival. So I guess how it came about. Yeah, so it actually wasn't my original idea and I'll, I'll share that here. Um, and I share it all the time. It was inspired by um, the Minnesota Monarch Festival. Um, so it's, it's the largest monarch festival here in the US as far as I know. And so um, I went out to learn about the monarch. I actually did a monarch um, workshop with some of the partners for that festival. And once I learned about it, um, like I said, I, 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 I actually, that's where I learned about um, the connection to um, to the Michoacan people and, and, you know, to Mexican culture there. And, and I was super interested in, in to learn like, okay, how does, you know, like, what, like I started seeing all these monarchs, like, wait a minute, I, I love soccer. And there's this team that's named after the monarch butterfly, uh, Mon Monarcas Morelia. And I'm like, my whole life it's been there. And like, I didn't even know about it. And so that's, that's how I started, you know, doing more research and learning that, uh, in fact, a lot of people from Michoacan uh, migrated to the Chicagoland area, um, and during the during the Great Migration, 
uh, a lot of them came here to work and a lot of them stayed and made this their, their home. And that includes in Chicago. And so once, once I learned that the community was here, I was like, you know what, like we need that celebration here. You know, there's no reason to go all the way to Minnesota. I mean, let, I mean, I invite everybody to go to Minnesota and, and check out that festival. It's amazing. Um, but why not have one here? And so that's, um, that's where the idea came from um, to, to start one here in East Chicago. And it's been a wonderful uh, festival each year um, so far. And I'm really looking forward to, you know, the hybrid approach. I know we're still coming out of our COVID world and, and whatnot, but I hope the East Chicago Monarch Festival is here to stay for, you know, many years to come. It, it's so much fun. Everybody should come out since September. So stay tuned um, with Joel on his Facebook page for the Nature Conservancy to learn more about that. At this time, we are now transitioning into the third segment of our, our presentation this evening. And it is beyond uh, privilege and honor uh, to welcome Barb Spies Labus to the stage. Uh, many of you will be familiar with her work. Um, if you're not familiar, she is an artist and an illustrator. She has created artwork for an ongoing series of educational outreach posters about the ecosystems of the Indiana Dunes coastal region for the Indiana Department of Natural Resources Lake Michigan Coastal Program. And this has been going on for many years and each and every one of them is a masterpiece. Most of us in the conservation community in Northwest Indiana collect them. So, um, she's also created several posters in the just around the corner along the South Shore Line poster series that you may see whenever you visit some of our cultural um, institutions across the region, our visitor centers, our libraries, our schools and whatnot. They're, they're distributed widely. Her work can also be seen at junebird.com. Uh, Barb is on stage tonight because she um, graciously agreed to develop four original illustrations for our brand new pollinator garden landscaping guide. And I'm beaming because the experience working with Barb and the process of watching her create these illustrations was and has been a highlight of my life. Um, so <laughs> I am um, going to share my screen once again. So Barb, um, what I've got up on the screen right now is the full spread. This is spring, summer, fall, and winter. Um, how on earth did you learn how to do this? <laughs> uh, well, I mean, I've, I'm a trained artist. I've got a Master of Fine Arts in Painting and Drawing, and um, I'm not a botanist or an entomologist or a scientist, though. Um, I did uh, develop this particular set of skills by working on the uh, series of the coastal region posters. Um, 16 years now, and I think we're on our eighth, we just completed our eighth poster, which and it came out last year during the COVID. So it hasn't quite made its debut yet. And that was the Prairie Ecosystem. But for those who aren't familiar with them, we're, I'm tasked with showing in one single image um, the range of plants and animals and insects and birds that are found in any one of these ecosystems. And so over these years, I've kind of got a knack for this sort of thing. And this is kind of what you wanted me to do for this publication too. Uh, only in this one, we included the human uh, role in this as uh, homeowners and gardeners, how, how their gardens um, can provide them this really special relationship um, beyond just beautiful flowers to understand their role in this critical uh, support for these insects, the pollinators and others. So, mm -hmm. so that's kind of how it came together. Um. 
Thank you, Barb. And I, I nearly stopped sharing my screen so I could pull up the, the poster series. And I'll, I'll try to do that at the end, just in case people are not familiar with that. Um, but what Barb was asked to um, create and, and be inspired to create for our pollinator garden landscaping guide what was you know four individual pieces that showcase the seasonal changes in a pollinator garden throughout the year not just what's happening with the plants but what's happening with the pollinators what people are doing so she had a lot to on her plate. I mean, this was not an easy task, but she was the perfect person to take this on. And, and what I'm showing now, Barb, um, is spring. <laughs> so I just wanted to um, highlight what is happening in spring in a native pollinator garden. Yeah, so, so here we have our homeowner and um, you could uh, imagine that she's either out picking violets for a little cozy spring posy to bring in the house, or maybe she's transplanting and dividing up some of her plants to spread them around more because violets are a very common um, garden plant. Uh, even people who don't garden notice violets in their lawns a lot, and they should not think of them as weeds because they support a very uh, beautiful butterfly in its larval phase, the great spangled fritillary butterfly. So don't don't mow those things away. Don't dig them up. <laughs> so, so we have our our, our homeowner, and and these um, all these four seasonal views of a garden are. It was a complex thing that we had to pull together. Um, we're sort of working off the garden templates that are in the pollinator guide. So, as you look at these, you may not immediately translate this corner of the garden into the woodland section of the garden, but it is a a uh, general uh, visualization of what that woodland portion of the garden would be. Trees with early spring, bloom, early spring blooming flowers and um, the early spring blooming plants that certain pollinators who are just emerging from hibernation, such as the queen bumblebee here, she's just emerged from her little um, place where she was hibernating, which is just a couple inches under your under the soil. And she is hungry. She's got a lot of work to do and she needs to find some pollen, some nectar right away and get busy. Um, and so she's sort of the star of this. She's like the one that's uh, featured front and center headed for the, um, the plants there just to get, yeah. So, um, so that's the, the sort of, um, the, I had to figure out how do I show this in, in its complexity with the humanity, the human role, the trees, the scale of tiny caterpillars to tall trees. So I've chosen to start with a very low perspective where it's like we're lying on the ground and our face is our we're eye level with the uh, blood root here. And we're, we're seeing the butterfly a little bit flying over us. Um, we also see in the background the trees. We're, we're low enough so that we can see the trees. Um, we've got a blooming red bud. We've got a blooming service berry. And um, I also took as inspiration in my creation my own garden, which is has a lot of these plants in it. Um, so I'm as with a lot of people, my, my uh, gardening with native plants for pollinators has been a process and it's an ongoing journey. I started like a lot of people just, you know, planting flowers for just their beauty and not really understanding the deeper role that these plants can play um, in our na natural ecosystems. And so I've, I've, started to plant a lot of these plants in my own yard. And so I've become very familiar with them myself. I did still have to do some research uh, because a lot of these things I'm not familiar with, but, um, uh, and, you know, it was just a really interesting challenge, a complex set of um, ideas that we wanted to get across to the viewer, like how this can be in your yard, what you can be doing in your yard to either 
enjoy it or uh, just continue to cultivate and um, provide these plants that'll sustain these pollinators um, and just be a beautiful thing to behold. And then make sense with our templates and then also <laughs> make sense with our ecosystems because right. we're, we're sort of um, educating our uh, readers on Northwest Indiana's incredible diversity of habitat. Um, and there's a map, a beautiful map in there. Um, and we've um, described this, we've described our gardens in the sort of language that we use for those ecosystems like woodlands, dune and swale, prairie, wetlands. Um, and so it's, it was a really wonderful like set of concepts that we had to like knit together in a, yeah. into an um, inspiring image. And it was a lot of work, but it was really a lot of fun. It was so much fun, Barb. And I, I think at one point um, we were joking about, um, you know, going back and forth about, you know, on, on one of the illustrations. And um, I, th I think the remark was, it's sort of like, Victoria, it's sort of like you're ordering a pizza, but instead of toppings, you're ordering <laughs> Yes. <laughs> and so um, just for, you know, the, the viewer's benefit, you see in the foreground here these violets and on um, on one side there's a butterfly nectaring on a violet and on the other side there's a caterpillar that's um, you know crawling up on a leaf and I said oh Barb could we have a couple of more blooms on the <laughs> and in the background you see um, the eastern red columbine which is um, just in front of a backdrop of anemones Right. And and on the left, you know, I thought at that about that time of the year is when all the lupins were in full bloom. I said, oh, goodness, Barb, could we could we maybe just add a couple of lupins in there, maybe, you know, and it, it was just like a, a gardener's dream come true to work with such a talented artist that could bring that vision to life and showcase the extraordinarily beautiful possibilities in a native garden. So that, that was spring, um, and there's four of these. So we were just looking at spring, here's summer. Summer, um, oh my gosh, what an explosion. I mean, I hope um, that people looking at this realize that each and every plant and pollinator featured here is native to our landscape, native to our region, and can be found in your home garden, in your home landscape, just by selecting the right kinds of plants for the right kinds of conditions. Um, so Barb, this was um, a prairie style planting? Yes, this, this kind of translates roughly to the templates for the prairie garden, which is the uh, one lower left corner of, if I'm remembering the arrangement in the booklet. Okay. And again, yeah, I have to force some real up close things because I need to look at um, blooms with tiny little bees on them and at the same time see the background of uh, this tall row of, of prairie plants, joe pie weed and liatris and and then also we're um, featuring on the left kind of the almost the full life cycle of the monarch butterfly on the milkweed plant on the left. So the, the monarch is um, dropping an egg on the underside of that leaf mm -hmm. and we've got a monarch caterpillar crawling on the other side and we've got a chrysalis attached to the underside of one leaf which they sometimes do but generally they crawl off somewhere else like on a ledge or something on your house or something and disguise themselves but I mean and also we wanted to show um, you know in summer if you've got these plants in your garden, you will see this like cloud of beautiful butterflies coming around. Um, and we've got our young student our, uh, who's taking a look with a magnifying glass to see maybe a monarch egg because that's a good way to look at the special shape of a monarch egg on the underside of the leaf. Um, and you know, this is the corner. We're in a neighborhood. We've got a fence. The neighbors will see the tops of these things. They'll see these wonderful butterflies flitting around. We've also got a little yard sign, like the booklet also highlights the way that you can get your garden recognized. 
and there's a lot of different organizations that'll um, offer a sign that you can put up because sometimes people feel like the your na native plant garden might need explanation because it's so abundant and wild looking. And so you get one of these little signs that, you know, it's, hey, I'm not just, you know, letting everything go and not tending to it. This is a well-managed, intentional thing that I'm doing here. And it's for the sake of these beautiful things that you get to see too, because they're going to fly across your yard to get to my yard. And then they're going to go to the nature preserve on their way to somewhere as they do their migration. <laughs> so. <laughs> oh. It's just wonderful. And we've got uh, several different pollinators featured here. Several different groups of the bees in the booklet are featured um, on the St. John's wort in, in the foreground here and also on the yellow coreopsis. Um, Barb has done a magnificent job highlighting the monarch life cycle on the milkweed. We've got that gorgeous tiger swallowtail in the foreground headed toward those cone flowers, a fritillary nectaring on liatris. We've got butterflies visiting the Joe Pie weed, you know, that is the, you know, the height of the garden, uh, you know, the backdrop there on the fence, the penstemon, the tritoscantia in the foreground, geraniums, you see uh, baptisia, the indigos on the right hand side, just the heliopsis, the false sunflower, through, I mean, just a joy to behold. A summertime prairie garden is a bounty for pollinators and I want to frame this and put it on my wall. I, I just love this. But it doesn't stop there for a pollinator garden in summer. And that's something that a lot of people don't understand. And so what a privilege to be able to showcase the possibilities for fall. So Barb, what you've done here is, is magnificent. It's Thank just you. Magnificent. <laughs> yeah, fall is one of those uh, seasons where you know, if you're uh, maybe the average gardener, um, you know, your petunias maybe are starting to fade and you're, you know, you're thinking, oh, that's it. I got to go get some mums and, and then I'm done. <laughs> but um, if you plant for the pollinators, uh, especially the migrating monarchs, um, those plants are critical for those butterflies. Um, that final brood that makes its way down from Canada in when do they start? Like late August into September. They're, they've got one butterfly goes like how many? 3,000 miles and they need sustenance. They need nectar. And if you cut down all your flowers or if you don't plant flowers with nectar, their options are severely limited. So um, some of these gorgeous flowers last well into the fall. These are largely um, native perennials, but there are also native annuals that you can plant that will provide that nectar for those. Um, but here we've, we're right, we've got our dune corner in the garden template. <laughs> we, we slipped in a, a view of Lake Michigan here for <laughs> Save the Dunes. And, um, so we've got this um, dune side garden with a water feature and lots of fall blooming plants and all the butterflies that are coming by. And then we also have, as Joelle mentioned, our, our hummingbird on the cardinal flower. That hummingbirds are also pollinators. They're, they're just coming to get nectar, but they're inadvertently pollinating the plants when they come up to the flower. So, um, and then we've got a, our little clear wing hummingbird moth in the lower left uh, nectaring on the pink monarda, which is starting to get a little faded at this point in the year. And so, Plants like the the um, the aster just above it uh, will bloom well into like October, I think. Some of these um, and provide those nectar sources for those butterflies that are getting ready to overwinter or on some trek somewhere. Absolutely, and the go-to um, fall flowers for native gardeners are typically the asters and the goldenrod. So. Um, here we have, you know, those purple asters and right above the, you know, bright yellow showy golden rods that are essential nectar sources, as, as Barb says, for those migrating monarchs and our other um, pollinators that are active late into the year. 
But there are other plants to consider as well. Um, in the corner there is a, a showering uh, vine, or a showering bloom of flowers on the virgin bower clematis. Um, that's another option. Um, and, and then in the front, Barb, um, I just wanted to bring people's attention to uh, the fringed gentian. And we, at one point during the development of the guide, we found an image of a bee butt in a fringed gentian and couldn't resist the, um, you know, the opportunity to show that in, in this illustration. And Barb's just done a, a, a marvelous job at that, a glorious job of our bee butt in a, in a fringe <laughs> gentian. <laughs> so, um, but the story doesn't stop there. There is one more illustration in this series. Um, this is winter, winter in a pollinator garden. When you're out there building your snowman and enjoying the sparkling snow, um, there's actually still some activity happening for our pollinators. Yeah, so this one kind of ties some of the other uh, insects that we saw previously, the um, in the leaf letter, leaf, leaf litter rather, we've got a cross section in this one, and this one starts to look more like my ecosystem posters, where we're, it's more of a um, diagram where we've cut away and we're seeing underground, we're seeing the soil under some leaf litter in the garden, um, and this leaf litter, you know, maybe it's in a garden bed, so don't. Uh, people who are thinking, I can't leave leaves on my lawn, you can just rake the leaves into the garden bed. <laughs> um, so that's what we're seeing here. And so we've got some labels. We see this tiny little, it's called the first instar of that great spangled fritillaries uh, larva. It's going to spend the winter alive in that leaf litter. So don't, if you, you know, if you bag everything up and send it off, what a tragedy that is. <laughs> um, our queen, our bumblebee queen has dug, as I said her earlier, her little place where she's gonna spend the winter. And we've also got some other bees that are commonly in a yard, minor bees, and they dig down little tunnels in the soil and their pupae are down there and they're gonna overwinter down there. And then over on the right side, it's under um, it's underneath our little column of pictures on my screen right now. But um, we have um, a chrysalid for a swallowtail, and that is hanging in these um, spent monard uh, monarda plants that are on the right. They're covered with snow. They're beautiful when they're covered with snow. So if you don't leave them standing, or if you cut them down and bag them and toss them you've limited that insect's opportunity to reproduce. So consider leaving your spent stems and your leaves in your garden beds as bird seed bird, that you can see we've got the goldfinches um, having a nice uh, little snack of the spent cone flowers on the left. And um, this is a view into our garden template sort of back to the prairie garden in the left corner or the corner there behind the cone flowers and behind the dad and the child making the snowman. So if you leave, you can see there's some tall stems back there, the Joe pieweed stems or some stems are gonna stand for a while. They'll eventually decay, break down. Some insects actually um, lay their eggs inside those stems so that their larva can overwinter and be protected. So consider just holding off, wait, wait, wait until what is it like, there's a certain point in the spring, Victoria, so many weeks into, or some temperature range or something, but. A week of 50 degrees. A week of 50 degree temperatures yeah. in spring. So yeah. with this, we just want you to see what is happening underground while, you, while the snow is there. You think it's all done, it's all dead, nothing's happening. That's not the case. We've got birds that are gonna visit, we've got, uh, the insects that are waiting, overwintering until the spring, and then it, the cycle starts again. Oh. <laughs> wow. And so you're not just an artist and illustrator, but you're an incredible advocate for our pollinators <laughs> and the habitat that they need to, to survive and thrive in our home landscapes. Thank you. Yes. <laughs>
so much. Oh, it was a joy. Thank you. It's a mutual privilege and joy. Everyone, um, thank you for tuning in. I hope that um, this hour, uh, we're a little bit over, but I hope that it has really enriched your life and invited you to consider the other ways of enjoying your native garden, the pollinators, um, and understanding that you are a powerful protector of them. Um, if you, you know, are a gardener, if you are an artist, if you are a photographer, if you have deep cultural connections, if you just love to learn more, if you're hooked for life on native plants or hooked for life on illustration, whatever the case may be, we hope that you find this information so irresistible that you literally cannot wait to get started. Barb's illustrations are featured in our new um, Living in the Dunes Guide, Volume 2, um, and it's coming out soon. So please be sure to, you know, visit savedunes.org. Um, Katie has posted in our Facebook chat how you can um, sign up to make sure that you receive the copy as soon as it's available. And, you know, stay connected. We have one more program tomorrow. We're, we're going to bring it all home and talk about how that landscape level work being undertaken by our conservation partners is strengthened um, and made more successful when each of us does our part to protect our pollinators. So with that, I want to thank again, Joelle, Susan, Barb, for everything that you do, how much inspiration you offer the world, and um, what a privilege it is to work with you. Thank you for being a part of our program. Thank you everyone for tuning in. Thank you for Katie's excellent editing of our videos and facilitation. And we will see you all tomorrow.